Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Advocates the Podcast. Today, we'll speak with Gobin Singh Deal, former cabinet minister, currently the member of parliament for Puchong, and of course, one of Malaysia's leading criminal advocates. Gobin walks us through his formative years growing up under the shadow of the Internal Security Act, his coming of age as an advocate, and how he approaches his criminal cases. So please enjoy this episode. Gobin Singh, welcome to Advocates, the podcast. Thank you for being with us. Hello, how are you? Very good, thank you. Gobin, you've just come back from Parliament. I know it's sitting uh, at the moment. Thank you for sparing the time. I'd like to kick off this interview as we normally do by asking you to tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, I was born in Penang and uh, of course, the family of uh, five of us siblings. There are four boys. We have a sister uh, and of course, my parents originally from Penang as well. So uh, primary school in Penang, secondary school in Penang. Then decided to go to Australia, did my VCE, got through that, then decided to go to uh, the UK to do law, I went to Warwick University, met you, uh, then, did, uh, <laughs> then did the bar. Oh, went downhill from there, yeah. And then, yeah, Lincoln. And, uh, yeah, uh, came back to KL after that and got into active practice. Well, that's a, that's a nice little summary. Let's drill down into a little bit of the details and, and, and growing up. And I think growing up, I'm interested in asking you firstly about growing up in a household where your father was so involved in politics and where politics was a very dangerous game. What was that like growing up in that sort of household? Well, I was born into a family of politics, you know, for as long as I can remember. You know, dad was an active politician and we went through different elections, different years, participated in that, of course, from a family point of view, uh, you know, you're there, so you see what happens, uh, you, you see how things operate, and of course, you get involved. Having said that, you, you know, we also realized that dad was in the opposition, which meant that he would have to take risks at time, which he did. And uh, of course, you know, it wasn't easy, but he was very, very strong in his beliefs, did what needed to be done, outspoken, as you all know. And of course, he had to face the consequences quite often for that. And uh, that's how it is we also came to understand how the police operate, you know, and that, that was in the early part of, of my life. And that's something that, in fact, started to shape the way me and my brothers and sister think. Right. So, yeah, so that, that's basically how it was. So it was but constantly being in a line where we saw and heard of our father more in the press at times uh, than we saw him at home. You know, then, of course, it's a question of us trying to give him that support that he needed moving ahead. Let me ask you this in a little bit more more detail. I mean, we know your, your father, the, the late, great Karpal Singh. I mean, he spent time uh, as a detainee under the Internal Security Act. How old were you when that happened? You know, that was back in 1987. I was 14 at the time. And how did you take that? Well, at that age, you don't really know uh, what's happening until it all settles in. You know, so I remember on the day of the arrest itself, we were, or the detention itself, yes, the day he was arrested. I remember brother and I were informed about it, but we didn't have, we didn't have much details. Uh, we were just told that there was a series of arrests and that dad was also arrested. And uh, of course, we then tried to find him, tried to get in touch with people in the know so that we could try and understand what was going on. Yeah, so that was at the beginning of it. And then subsequently, we were informed that uh, there was a 60-day detention period. And he was, of course, uh, taken to various different police stations, interrogated. And subsequent to that, there was a detention order that was issued, directing that he be detained in Kamunting Detention Center for a period of two years. That was the beginning of that two-year process. Uh, very difficult. We used to visit him in Kamunting. It was it was tough because we, we saw how it affected him health wise. Of course, mentally he's very very strong. Uh, that, that's 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 comforting for you. Then again, it does wear you down at times. Of course, being uh, 14 years old at that point in time, you don't understand the depth of it all. You know, you know that something's going on. You know that it's not right. You know that uh, you need to be strong and 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 you know you got to stand up against it. You don't really have a choice. You you're in it and and you've got to deal with it. And I think at that age, those who are 14. 
have many different uh, concerns. They do different things, you know. But for me, it was it was a question of trying to deal with the situation and trying to uh, live with the fact that that detention and that we do not know how long this is going to go on for. Say it's two years, and that's what's written on the order. But some say to us that it could extend beyond that. Uh, there could be an extension. So uh, you know, we really didn't know what to expect moving ahead. What we could do is uh, stick together and try our very best to support each other, and of course, hope that it came to an end and that he would be released soon. And in 1988, in March, he was released by the High Court in Ipoh. Uh, he was successful on an application of habeas corpus. Justice Pei Sui Chin ordered his release, and he was released. And uh, I, I was in court that morning, and there was a huge turnout to celebrate the occasion. Uh, but we were informed again that uh, the special branch, what they call me, re-arrest him. And uh, <clears throat> they subsequently did. So uh, it then started again. So he went through the whole process again. And, and then a second uh, detention order was issued against him. And then that went on until subsequently in 1989, he was released. So three years he spent in time without trial? Uh, no, he went in, uh, in 1987 and came out in 1989, uh, early, early 1989. Let me wind it back a little bit, Gobin, and ask you about what it was like uh, at home. 14 years old and you've got four siblings. How big a part did your mother play in holding the family together and, and giving you that strength? Oh, my mom was really the pillar of it all, you know. She's definitely an iron lady. You must remember, my mom had just given birth to uh, my youngest brother at that point in time. He was just three months old. So she was, uh, she, she had to deal with that. Uh, she was taking care of him. And uh, at the same time, dad was in detention. And all of them were very young, you know, Jagdeep was 16, me 14, uh, Ram 11, and then uh, Sangeet 7. And, it, you know, it's not easy for... For my mum, but she was the one that uh, gave us strength. You know, I think there's something that you know you 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 can't you. It's difficult to describe, but you you just you just saw her taking complete control and charge of the situation, managing the children. She also had to run the legal offices at that time. She's not a lawyer by profession, but she was working in the office uh, managing it uh, for me. Because there were still lawyers in the office at that time, right? Who were still yes, so yeah. there were yeah. legal assistants who yeah. helped yeah. us out. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she, she had to basically uh, um, make sure that things kept moving, you know, so that, you know, we could make uh, ends meet. And it was 18, 18 months is a long time. I think uh, it, it wasn't easy for her at all. Uh, but she somehow or another pulled through. And not only that, uh, she somehow or another made sure that we carried on with what we needed to do. Uh, education was important. Jagdeep went on to Australia at that time uh, to do his, uh, the, the VCE. And uh, the rest of us continued with, with life uh, as best you can. Yes. So uh, my mum was definitely the, 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 the main pillar of it all. You were 14 when your dad was detained. My, my question is this. Did it change you? Did that experience change you? I mean, were you a, a different sort of young man before and after, before he was arrested and after he was released, you think? Yes, of course it did. Uh, it had a huge impact on, on all of us, not just me. But on you specifically, were you like a happy-go-lucky kid before that and before and after it, you know, you, you, you changed became more serious when I mean, when you are 13 14 years old you know you you look at you look to you look forward to certain things in life you know it's 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 that period where you know you have lots of friends you go out you know and and uh, uh, you have a good time you know and uh, in, that's what everyone else did but when you have placed in my position where your father is detained and you know you need to help out uh, with the family uh, then it's a bit different and it, it definitely changed me because I think we have to understand that uh, it was not just him being detained. Uh, while he was in detention, we had to deal very often with the police. We had to continuously be in touch with them to find out where he was, how he was, try and get appointments to meet him. So we had a lot of running around to do, you know, the, the police being the police uh, at that time. There was a lot that I saw. Of course, when you go and visit dad, you actually go uh, into the police stations when he's there. Uh, otherwise, you actually go into the detention centers so you actually see a lot of things that others who are 13 and 14 don't. Uh, so it, and it also makes you uh, a lot stronger because you realize that, you know, you've got to deal with uh, the problem yourself. And uh, whether you like it or not, whether you're old enough isn't the point. You have to deal with it. It pushes you to, to start to think uh, about how it is you can solve the problems that ordinarily uh, people of a much older age would be dealing with. So yes, uh, when my dad was detained, I was perhaps 
a bit younger in my thinking. Uh, but after that, 18 months of detention and having to deal not just with uh, the detention itself, but also with, as I said, the environment, having to go through the court process with him, which uh, I did most of the time that he was in court in Ipoh, what do you call, arguing out his own habeas corpus application himself. You know, there was also times when he was in hospital because he was very ill. So we had to basically be in hospital with him as well. So it was it was really a combination of so many different facets to uh, that whole detention process that started giving me a different perspective of how life is and uh, what we need to do in order to deal with the problems at hand. And I think subsequent to that, of course, uh, that also shaped my thinking moving forward. And of course, it had a lot to do with me deciding to become a lawyer or rather to, do, to read law and then to subsequently uh, get involved with politics uh, as well. I was asking you about your period as a student before you went to university. Were you always a good student? <laughs> of course I was a good student. <laughs> okay, enough said. Enough said. Let me then now ask you about you moving from your VCE in Australia to, to do law. I think, you know, at least in Malaysia, most people know that all five of you became lawyers. Did your choice of career uh, have anything to do with what your father did? Well, first of all, uh, it was not all five of us that became lawyers. The youngest chap, uh, he was a smart one. Uh, he, he didn't do law. Oh, is that right? Okay, okay. I didn't know that. So four, four out of five. Yeah, four out of five. Yeah. So what, what's your youngest do? Youngest brother? He's working with a company now, a startup company that, yeah, but he went to Warwick as well, you know? Oh, is that right? Okay, okay. I didn't know that. Okay, so yeah, so coming back to it. So tell us about, tell us about your, your choice of career in law. Well, at, at the beginning, uh, to, be, to be honest, when I was in primary school uh, and, you know, early secondary school, I, I actually wanted to become an engineer. And I was interested in aeroplanes, so I was looking at aeronautical engineering, and I, I had a habit of taking things apart. Uh, you know, and took my mum's car radiator out one day as well. She, she didn't. She wasn't very happy about that. <laughs> I, that's that's what I wanted to do. But uh, as I said to you earlier, I mean, you know, uh, once you are thrust into a position where you have to deal with the police, you see uh, a lot of things that you think are not right. Uh, you have got to you know, somehow or another uh, wrestle with them to get even the sim most simple of things done. Even an appointment to see someone uh, was, was a task. Then then you ask yourself, you know, um, is that right? And of course, you being uh, 14, uh, you, you would not take easily to that. So you start thinking, you know, is this kind of a thing uh, common? Uh, is this how it is? Then you start asking yourself about the law, you know. So then what's the law on this? Then you start reading up. Then you realize that, look, you know, that's not how it should be. And then you get friends who are to a lawyer uh, speaking, having conversations about, uh, you know, uh, why it is, uh, what was going on was wrong, how it is we needed to deal with it. You know, the, the entire uh, habeas corpus application was very interesting because I was then exposed to the constitution, the fact that there were provisions there that, that were very important. And uh, of course, you know, if you go to court and uh, you're able to convince a judge that, that there's been a violation of some procedural requirement, leading to that detention, then of course, uh, he has the power to order your release, you know, and you feel empowered because you know that if you are able to, to, to put up an argument, which Mr. Kapal did, he, he went not just on procedural irregular, irregularities, he also argued a case of bad faith and mala fides, you know, in, in, in the way in which the detention orders against him were issued. You know, you become very inspired by the fact that, that the law can empower you and that you can actually do something to deal with this. So in other words, it's not just the case that the police had powers. We had our rights as well. And there was a process by which we could enforce those rights. You know, when you did that, and of course, you uh, you know, we had successfully argued the application for able corpus in the High Court EPO. You see the whole process, the judge asking questions, federal counsel coming to court and arguing in response. You know, it, it starts to then build on you, you know. You realize that's that, that that's what drew you in. Yeah, that's what uh, real life experience. I told myself, look, I think you know this is something that I need to do because I want to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. And if it did happen to anyone else, then I wanted to, I wanted to be in a position where you know I could help them. You know, that is where it started. And then of course, you know, at, at that age, I missed out on school a lot because I was moving around a lot with my mum. And uh, there were also a lot of NGOs that were trying to help us out. So, for example, you had Aliran and uh, many others, uh, even some uh, NGOs from, from overseas, you know, MSD International and things like that, they, they were helping out. So there, was a lot of, uh, there were lots of programs, there were lots of events 
talks uh, that we went for where you know people came to support us and i think the support that was shown uh, by ordinary malaysians uh, were very it was very encouraging but again you know at 14 years old you're not you're not very sure of how to how to put all those ends together you know but uh, you as i said you don't have a choice so you just have you, you just have to figure it out and of course you need to be quick because you need to use all of it uh, and 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 that's what drives you you know drives you to get from one day to the other hoping that something will happen tomorrow uh, because you know someone has said that maybe this weekend uh, someone will be released you know and everybody is waiting to find out more and uh, and and you know uh, you know those days you didn't have the the kind of connectivity you have today uh, when you found out something you had to physically move around to find out more you know try and try and get clarifications and and everybody was excited all that dawned on me and i thought i thought i thought to myself yeah you know i think uh, this is what uh, i do this is what we need to do you know uh, and that's well, let me let me ask you sorry let me jump in there and just ask about your period in university uh, studying law and then the bar did you find that a challenge or was that something that you took to quite easily Well, no. I think when I was in Australia, I, I took up uh, one of the subjects I did was legal studies. That was uh, I, I was um, very inspired by by that talk that that subject. I spent a lot of time uh, reading and and trying to understand more about uh, the law, as I said, uh, in particular constitutional remedies and things like that. So when I went to UK and I did law, of course, uh, to me it was. not a challenge but it was something that i was i was interested in i i looked at it from a completely different perspective uh, you know because i'd been through it i i been through i'd been through the real life process where you need to reach out to the law to 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 defend yourself against what would otherwise be called serious cases of uh, serious cases of injustice so uh, it is from that perspective that i i start looking at things of course you know you have to you, you go ahead and you carry on with the causes that 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 exist but i think a lot of the what we call arguments a lot of the discussions that we had uh, in university resonated with me a lot more uh, because of uh, how it is i i because I, of what I, you've been through i had seen it uh, yeah. uh happen yeah. not just not just to me but to people around me in life so yeah and of course uh, when you go through the bar i mean you and i know uh, it, the bar is a very very intense exam at least uh, the bar that we did at that time i'm not sure how how it is how's changed today so it was a lot of work and it was it was hard work it was hard work i at that point of time my dad had come to see me in in london and and he had told me you know that you got to get through because i need a lot of help you know uh, and uh, <laughs> so no choice so okay so when when you went back when after the bar you went back your brother your elder brother jagdeep was already back here and he was already working he was already working with your father right with mr karpa at that time So was there did you ever have a choice of going anywhere else was it sorry you're coming here Oh uh, well my dad didn't say it that way uh, in fact my dad never told us to do law you know he he never forced us to do something that we didn't want to do he was always very uh, supportive of of us you know even talking about other professions you know i, I remember that very clearly but as i said uh, after what happened in in 87 uh, things changed and i think it was it was quite clear that we were all going in that direction so when my dad talked to me about work I don't think the question of me working with somebody else was even close to my mind. Uh, to me, it was yes, I'm going to come back and I want to sit with you and see what we can do and how we can. Uh, I, I was looking forward to it, and I came back and got got right to it. And I mean, your your the practice that you joined then in uh, Karnapal Singh and Co. And I mean, I I I know the the KL office and Pudu Pudu very well. But your your father had a pretty wide ranging practice. I mean, he had a, a good proportion of it was very serious criminal work. but he also did civil work and when you went in did you go in thinking uh, you know you wanted to do the the the, civ- the the criminal work or did you did was it was it uh, were you happy to have a mix of the two at that time i think when you work in mr kapal's office you 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 are thrust into the deep end from the very beginning you know so it's really a question of all right tomorrow uh, these are all the cases that we need to deal with and you look at it and you go how are we going to do all this right uh, and and you know he doesn't push you but yet put you in a position where you just have to say all right i need to know what's going on and because of that you start looking into all files you start familiarizing yourself with different kinds of of litigation you know, criminal civil constitutional administrative and then after a while you decide what you prefer to do so when did that happen with you to me i think 3 months into practice 3 uh, months into chambering uh, I, i realized that you know there's a lot about malaysian law that we from the uk have to learn 
you know, there's the Evidence Act, there's the Criminal Procedure Code, there's the Penal Code, things which are, which are quite, you know, which we need to get familiar with because we don't, we're not exposed to that in the UK. So it is because of that that I decided that I would want to focus on that first. Uh, and I think then the, the beginning of the, the, the criminal, the beginning of chambering was all about that. And then subsequently, of course, we went on to do more things that were slightly bigger, uh, the constitutional challenges and this, that, and what have you not, especially the, the, the appellate work that Mr. Kapal was, I, I think Mr. Kapal's work, a lot of it was appellate. He did so many appeals, you know, and uh, that is something that uh, really helped because it was quite, it, it was quite easy for you to pick up a record, read it, and you will understand how a trial works here. You can actually try and you can, you, you can visualize it in your mind. And then you look at the application of law and then you understand what a misdirection is. And then you understand why it is important for you to understand what a misdirection is, because that is how you start off uh, with an appeal and then how you are going to then develop on it and so on and so forth. So it was it was very, very interesting. OK, so I mean, c- coming back to that period in time, just uh, a young Gobind Singh starting out. I mean, clearly your father is uh, I mean, he was a colossus on. Sorry, yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, your father was a colossus in, in, in the courts in, in, in Malaysia, no doubt about that. Uh, but was there anyone else that you worked with in those kind of younger days that inspired you in any way? We, we, we worked with many lawyers at the criminal bar. At that point in time, I remember Mr. Fernando was a close friend of mine. Christopher uh, Fernando, yeah. We had uh, uh, Bachan, Kumarendran, uh, uh, and of course, uh, one of those who really uh, uh, helped me out a lot was Siddham Baram, you know. Yeah, we learned from many, many different people. I learned from many, many different people because uh, there were cases in which we had joined accused, for example. And uh, Mr. Kapal could not make it because he was attending to an appeal, for example. He asked us to stand in. And when we go there, you know, you have other counsel, senior counsel who will guide you, you know. So uh, there was a lot that, that uh, we learned from different people. As well. uh, similarly, at the civil bar, there were lots of senior federal counsel, for example, that, that, that we uh, had to face in court. And a lot of them were very kind. And very, very uh, helpful, you know. Uh, so these are people who basically helped me uh, in, in the younger years. Now, you moved out and set up your own firm after a few years with Kralpal Singh and, and Co. Uh, why was that? What had happened was, I think in 1999, I suggested to Mr. Kapal that we expand the practice. At that point in time, uh, Kralpal Singh and company had offices in Penang and, and KL, Kuala Lumpur. And uh, I thought that, you know, I wanted to see how setting up a, a firm works from scratch. So what I did was I suggested that we, uh, what he call set up office in Johor Bahru. And Mr. Kapal agreed. He says, he said, look, let's go down and, 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 and see what we can do. And then in the year 2000, uh, that office was set up. And I uh, was the one that was managing that office in Johor. So I, I was there for, I think it was five years that we were there. Uh, and then subsequently, I told uh, Mr. Kapal that, you know, I, I wanted to try and set up my own practice, you know, to see uh, what it was like, uh, you know, uh, to, to do it yourself. Of course, at that point in time, it was like, hey, why, you know, why do you want to go on your own? You know, some, some asked that question, but Mr. Kapal was very, very, uh, he just uh, looked at me and he said, look, if that's what you want to do, you know, then you, you go ahead and I wish you luck, you know. So that's what happened. And that's the reason why I set up my own practice. I wanted in, in to, KR. Yeah. Uh, yes, I started off in JB first. Yeah, and, and then, then in, and then in yeah, KL. I came, back, came back to KL because uh, I think in 2007 I was looking at an election in 2008, so I, I came, I brought the office back to KL, KL and then subsequently uh, after after the elections in 2008, I I shut down the JB practice in 2011. Right. So let me ask you this. I mean, and this is something I've I've noticed with Jagdeep and you. I mean, I know the two of you. I don't really know the the, the rest of the siblings, but you always refer to him as Mr. Karpal. Where did that come from? I don't know. We refer to our seniors as Mr. I mean, uh, Kapal, Mr. Bachan, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Nando. Uh, Mr. So it's just something that came naturally for, for, for you guys to refer to him in that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, now. Well, yeah. Although we do, we actually, we call him boss in the office. So. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah. And also at home, uh, uh, we, we tend to call him boss. <laughs> okay. Let's talk a little bit more granularly about uh, the kind of practice you have. I mean, it's largely criminal. So let me start by asking you, how old were you when you did, did your first death penalty case on your own? I think the first death penalty case that I did was in, on my own. It was in 1990. It was about a year into practice, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And I remember it was a murder trial in Shah Alam. And uh, it was a very, it was, it, 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 it was a tough case. It was very, very tough because the evidence was stacked against the client. Then really became a question of strategy and, and, and how, 
how it is we could try and slowly chip away at the prosecution's case, you know. And I remember in that particular case, there were two, uh, and the reason why I remember this is because I was just looking at another file, which reminded me of it. There were two issues to it. One, it related to the identity of the deceased. In that case, the deceased was severely uh, burnt by a chemical uh, concoction of sorts. And it was a case where they, they could not identify the, the body physically. So what they needed to do was uh, rely on uh, dental records. And of course, at that point in time, in I think back in 98, 90, 97, 98, you know, it wasn't, I mean, that, that was something that was quite uh, unusual. So we managed to create doubts there. The second part was, of course, a Section 27 uh, argument, basically information leading to discovery and how it is an accused person is subjected to oppression, torture, and what have you not, whether or not the statement that he makes uh, is admissible in court. Right. What was the result of that one? He was acquitted. He was acquitted. So let me ask you this. I mean, your first year in practice and you're doing a death penalty case. What sort of mindset did you have going in? Well, I think the general position, of course, would be that you look at the file and you, 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 I mean, you, you, you worry, you know, you worry because you don't, you're not, you're not used to it. You're not experienced and you're wondering uh, what do you do, you know, and uh, you're before a judge and, uh, you know, at, at, at that point in time, you are not very, very sure of yourself. I mean, just to put it bluntly. Yeah, right? I mean, okay, but but uh, I'm more interested in in also the the kind of emotional uh, weight you must have had to carry because it's yeah. somebody else's life in in your hands. Yes, your very inexperienced hands at that time. Right. How do you and deal with that? As I, as I was saying, you know, because you you're not very sure of yourself, so you you keep asking yourself, you know, are you are you doing it right? Have you have you done the right thing? Have you asked the right questions? Have you put uh, a proper case, a, a defense uh, forward, you know, did you miss something out? But then on the other side, of course, you know, you've got people who come and ask you, look, why are you defending people uh, who are charged for crimes like this? Uh, you know, so so you, there's so much going on in your mind. Uh, you realize that, um, you know, you need to be very quick on your feet in court because in a criminal trial, you know, it's not like a civil trial where you, you're pretty much given notice of documents of the case for the other side and what have you not. But in criminal practice, especially at that time now of course you get some documents uh, by that time you know it, it would just come at you uh, on the day itself and you would have to make decisions you would have to listen to a witness giving evidence uh, from the box and on the spot you will have to cross-examine you will need to understand uh, identify and and of course pitch uh, your case then then you see so you come back and you, you you start wondering you know did you do it right but did you feel any extra weight because it was a death penalty case yes yes yeah yeah you definitely feel it. You definitely feel and, it. And do you feel that? Do you feel that now as well? You still do get sometimes. I mean, you know, you you and I know there are cases that that are, you know, in which you see a point and you you know you know that there's an arguable point. There's some cases which you know don't present that you know, and then you're thinking, now how are you going to get around this one? You know, but I think over the years, what uh, I have learned is that to me, yes, uh, it, a criminal trial, it is important to understand the nature of the case uh, for the prosecution, the charge. But I think what is more important is to make sure that you look at it from a very, very professional point of view. I mean, your job is to make sure that there is a proper application of law before or not before there can be a conviction. And it's your duty to make sure that you ensure that there is, if there is going to be a conviction, then there must be full compliance with the law and no miscarriage of justice. So it does not, that that does not change looking at the nature of a case. It, it, it doesn't, it, you know, some say that some cases are more serious than others. Yes, on the facts, but as a lawyer, I think for you, the uh, duty is the same. you got to make sure that what the prosecution does is in accordance with law. And if there is a violation of, of any rules that you think that can be used to your client's advantage, then you have to take it and you have to take it to the hill. Gobin, now that you've been in practice for almost 30 years now, uh, would you say that your approach to preparation of a case, have, a criminal case I'm talking about, has changed over the years? Yes, yes, I mean, totally. What do you do differently now um, from when you were you were you were greenhorn defending a death penalty case first year in practice, and how you do it now? Now that you are you now. You see, when you okay, when I started practice, uh, you know, we we I looked at a charge, and I was trying to figure out how the prosecution was going to pitch its case and what I needed to do to to defend the client in response to that. So most, most of it at the early stages was about what was coming my way. 
you know, and how I was going to deal with it because you didn't have that experience, you see. But uh, now it's a totally different uh, approach because I look at a charge and I can say uh, at the very outset, okay, this is what it's going to be, right? This is the two or three options. This is how it's going to come. And you then, you, you can look at it and say, okay, you, 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 from the start, you are able to say where you want to reach at the end of it. Okay, so what you do, therefore, is to strategize or to formulate a strategy getting uh, to where you want, which you can only do if you're experienced and you understand uh, what's involved, how you need to deal with it, and how you're going to get there. Uh, of course, you don't have the experience, then, uh, you know, you will, as I said, you will wait for it to come. And then, uh, you know, you, you take your chances as and when. <laughs> um, <laughs> let, let me ask you, uh, uh, Gobin, uh, just going back, sorry, just one last thing about the death penalty that I'd like to get from you. And I mean, I, because most of the guys you have to understand on our show, we, we interview all from the civil bar. We don't get many um, uh, lawyers, advocates from the, from the, from the criminal bar and, and one, you know, where there is a death penalty as well. You know, for us at the civil bar, we're very laughy, jokey with clients. We refuse profession here. You tend to get to know the client. In your, at the criminal bar, when you're dealing particularly with these sort of death sentence case, do you, do you, in your mind, try to just keep that real distance between you and the client? Well, you, you know, you're a human, you know, uh, at the end of the day, when you meet someone and that person says, okay, look, you know, I, I, uh, there's a problem and I face a very serious charge and I need you to help me, you know, what do you think we can do? Do you think uh, we're going to win? Do you think there's a problem? Uh, you have to answer all these questions and you have to answer them honestly, you know, whether you like it or not, you would be in a position where you will have to speak to them and develop that kind of a friend, a professional relationship with them. And uh, it is always difficult because, as I said, you know, there, there are cases where you know that, okay, you, you have a good chance because, you know, the evidence is not stacked against you. But then again, you also have the other set of cases where, you know, it's difficult. And I think uh, <clears throat> it is not easy. It's not, it's not easier for them, the clients, because uh, these clients are, are held in custody or in remand throughout the trial. So it's, it's, it's more difficult because they, to them, they think about their case all the time. When they, for example, when you meet, you, you, you meet them and, and they want to ask you questions, they want to spend a, a bit of extra time with you. You know, I, I, to me, I understand that completely, you know, uh, and I, I, do, I do my best uh, to try and sit and, 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 and give them, uh, you know, uh, uh, the answers that they want and try and help them in whichever way I can. And then subsequently, when it comes to the trial, you do your best in court, you know, a lot of things happen. You need to take instructions. You need to know that the client needs to know that he can talk to you. And you also uh, want to know that, you know, you can speak to the client and you know the client is going to be on a level with you so that you can deal with it quickly. And yeah, you, you definitely will have that uh, sort of a friendship and relationship with the client. Mm. Tough to manage that, that this, this sort of dispassion. This episode of Advocates the Podcast is supported by Taylor's Law School, where you get to learn about law and justice. Explore how these top advocates battle injustice as they tell us their stories. Could I ask you a, a bit on the trial process? I mean, over the years now, you must have cross-examined thousands and thousands of witnesses. In, in, in doing, in questioning witnesses, in cross-examining them particularly, would, would you have some indication after a while of cross-examining that, you know what, this witness is really not telling the truth? Do you have any, what sort of clues you're looking at you're looking out um, whether the fellow is really on the level or whether he's actually trying to, you know, cover up something here. In other words, when do you, when do you smell blood in the water? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, let me just perhaps divide this into two parts, okay? There is the first scenario where you deal with a witness that has got a reputation for being untruthful. So you go in there and you know that here's a man that can and will tell lies if he has to. And of course, the reason you know this is because you would have taken instructions, you would have looked at the case, studied it, you would have understood that this is going to be a witness, you would have checked uh, this witness out and realized that in other cases, this is what he did, or in different places, this is what happened. And so you, you basically have an indication of the fact that this is a slippery uh, witness, which can say all sorts of things. So in that scenario, you go to court, you know that uh, here's a person that's going to give evidence that's probably going to be harmful to your client and you got to deal with him and you know that he's probably going to hold a, a, a whole firm to his ground, but you have to break him somehow. So you will need then to lead evidence of, uh, of instances where, you know, uh, he has either uh, been untruthful or, you know, where you can show that uh, there's reason by which the court 
uh, can choose not to believe him. So in that kind of a case, you are already in court. You already know that you are up against uh, somebody who's, uh, who's you know, uh, has the propensity to say things that are not true. So you start cross-examination, of course, then you go right to it. Then, of course, you will end up with a situation because he would have given evidence in chief. And in chief, he would have said things. So you are, you, that's your starting point. You start knowing that this is what he's already said. And you start knowing what of his evidence is harmful to your client. Your client. So you build it up. And of course, then subsequently, you try and uh, uh, what do you call narrow down to that. And of course, if you're able to crack him, you crack him. If you're not, then uh, basically you just challenge him and then uh, try and find other ways around it. So that's the first witness because uh, uh, you, you start off knowing that you're dealing with that kind of a character. The second one is a bit more problematic. The second scenario is where you deal with a person that has no reason to lie, has no reason to be untruthful. Uh, and of course, uh, his evidence uh, is not going to help you either. So what happens in a case like that is then you look for something in his evidence which you know can be used to contradict him. It's not the case that he's an unfruitful fellow, you know, but it's just that as anyone would, uh, he would have made a mistake somewhere. And then, of course, it is for you to find a way uh, to get him to go down a path where he, uh, what do you call, uh, he, he, he takes uh, a position in the case and then to confront him with what you have. But he's not an untruthful, he's not a, a witness who's generally untruthful. Uh, you know, he's not a shady or slippery fellow, you know. He's actually a, a, a police officer who just does his job. But then again, people will ask you like, hey, you know, he's an honest guy, right? So why do you do this, right? Uh, why, why are you trying to contradict him? But then that's the dilemma, isn't it? Because you're a lawyer and you know that at the end of the day, there's a contradiction. And that contradiction is something that can be used, uh, what you call, to shake his evidence, uh, which is what is necessary to create doubts in the case of the prosecution. And whether you like it or not, that contradiction is going to be a contradiction that relates to the case. So then, of course, it will be a case whereby, you you know, once you are able to, to lead him down that particular path and then put this to him, then it comes to a question of whether he can explain it. Then it's for the judge to decide uh, whether he chooses to believe him or not. Uh, so that kind of a situation is a bit more, it's, it's a bit more difficult. Because if you don't find something, then you're in trouble. If you can go to court, the witness is telling the truth and there's nothing you can do to shake him. That's that. You're stuck with his evidence. And I think that's also in civil cases. You know, uh, we, 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 see, we see it all the time. So, yeah, those are the two different scenarios that you have. Okay, let me ask you now about your, how you prepare for cross-examination. Because again, I think you, uniquely, you are going to give us a, a, a way of doing it that we've not heard before, even from criminal barristers in the UK where you get witness statements ahead. So in Malaysia, to put this in context, you don't get a witness statement. Evidence in chief is all oral. Nowadays, you get some documents by way of discovery. And then you listen to that witness statement and you got to stand up and, and cross-examine. Now, we all know that you don't prepare on the spot and, and, and do that cross-examination. So what do you do in the office preparing for, let's take for an example, a investigating officer, an IO. How do you prepare for his cross-examination in the office? I think the first thing you need to do is to understand what the case for the prosecution is. So you will be able to sort of draw it out on a board. All right, this is what their case is, which means that they're probably going to call these, uh, these witnesses who will say this, that, and the other, which takes it from the start right to the end, which is uh, what they call how, how it is uh, uh, you think that the case will unfold. Now, once you do that, then you've got to start asking yourself what your defense is. There are cases where you have a strong defense, which means that you know uh, uh, you you start off your cross examining the complainants to begin with, and of course your cross examination of the complainant will follow through to the I.O. Uh, there are cases where there's no defense, so you got to look for technical defenses. And technical defenses, of course, it will be more on police officers who did certain things, searches, uh, procedural. and procedural aspects of it. So if you're looking at the I.O., it really depends on where the case has come. But ultimately, right, you would want to be in a position where you can you're you're able to put uh, to the I.O., a position that is, which resonates with the facts already adduced. Uh, one of the things that I've learned uh, over the years is that if you try and, 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 and if you try and put up a defense that is at odds with the facts generally, it's not going to get you anywhere. But if you put a defense that somehow is consistent with some of the facts, that's something that somebody would want to think about. And it's got to be reasonable because you have a judge 
that is listening to this. And at the end of the day, he sees cases and hears, I mean, he's probably heard, heard so many of these cases and heard all of it before, right? So when it comes to cross-examining uh, an IO, I think you have to be very clear with what you want to achieve before you get to court. Then, of course, it's a question of whether or not you are able to do your own investigations behind the scene. And this is very important. I think a lot of people think that you just go to court and uh, you just work on what you already have in court. But I think that, that there's a lot to be gained by you actually doing that extra, uh, taking, taking that extra steps to find out something about the case which you could actually confront the I.O. with. Now, I'll give you a simple example. This is something that what you call I saw in a case just uh, a couple of weeks ago. The prosecution's case against the accused, two of them, is that they were carrying bags out of a car. And they were carrying bags out of a car, the bags of which contain drugs, right? And that's what the police report is. The police report is that I was at this place at this particular time and I saw these two people and they were carrying bags. We then approached them, we uh, checked the bags and we found drugs. Now, if the car was parked, say, for example, in a compound, a particular place, it's not an open space, it's a compound, uh, 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 a, gated, a gated piece of land, which is what our case was. Then the question was, the, the client's uh, version is that, hey, we didn't put and we, we didn't carry anything out of the, of the car. When we got there, we were asked to drive the car there. When we got there, there was somebody else who came to the car and took things out of, of the booth. Right? What do you do? You see, how, how do you deal with that? Because the police officers are all going to come and say, we were all there. We all saw nobody else. So what you do is you go to the place and then you realize that, hey, there's a fence uh, that locks this place up. There's a gate that allows cars to enter or exit the place. Then you check and see if there's an address. And there is an address. And then you also go and check a bit further and you find that there's a shed there. Of course, there's a shed, but the shed is empty. There's nobody there. If you go and do a bit more work, you realize that there are electricity bills that actually go to that particular lot of land that is in the name of the owner of the lot of the land. So then you go and find out who the owner is and you ask the owner, hey, look, why would you be paying electricity bills for that place if nobody stayed there, right? And then he says, yeah, there actually is somebody who's staying there, isn't it? So now it's not a question of whether or not that person who actually stayed there removed the bags from the car. The fact that there was somebody else there, which the police deny, is enough to doubt it. How interesting is that? Can I ask you this, uh, Gobin? Because uh, honestly, I never saw that side of it. I mean, this investigation side that you have to do. And do you do this yourself or do you get your associates or do you have investigators to do it for you? Well, I will tell you, I mean, in some cases, for example, we have our own experts who give us evidence and, and, and that's similar in the, in the civil side. But I work with lots of solicitors who are, who are quite good. So we actually sit, we have a discussion, we have a, a coffee together. We talk about all the possibilities in the case. And then eventually we, yeah, we then decide how to, as I said, you know, you, you, you look at it and you say, if the IO is in the box, what are we going to say to him? And this is what we need. If we are going to put this particular question to him and this is what we need to look for now and so we do it right okay and then you assign someone to to, to go off and, and and do it after that from your team that's really interesting thank you for that i want to now just come back to the uh, cross-examination and, and i know i've worked with you and i mean you've got the you've got these a4 books that you carry notebooks that you carry around right uh for every case it's your diary and then you've gone once your diary and then you've got one and then when it finishes you have another one how many of those have you collected over the years by the way i well we well, I, I really don't know. There's, there's a lot. Every file has got, every file has got its own book. Ah, okay, okay. So let me ask you about your preparation for cross-examination. So you know what you want to get from the I.O., let's say, for example. Do you write down every question you intend to ask or do you put it in sort of just bullet points? And has that evolved over the years? I don't write questions down. I, I just basically put points that I need to establish through that witness. How I do it depends on what happens in the day of the hearing itself. And just like uh, Razlan pointed out just now, right, you go to court and you have different witnesses that say different things in court. So it really depends on what they say and how it is you need to approach it. Sometimes the witnesses just give it to you straight away. You know, you don't even have to ask them a question in, in examination in chief. They say it and then you, then you don't have any questions, you see. Just get on with it. For me, I've always said that I think the greatest skill a lawyer can learn is when to keep your mouth shut. 
can I just follow up on that? Um, because you know, in, in the context that Gopal has explained just now, you, you do you do crime, right? And criminal work in Malaysia is totally opposite civil work in the sense that you don't get any documents except for those few documents you allow under 51A. Now, you are also a legislator. Do you, don't you think this is rather odd that in other countries, in criminal matters, I'm, I'm referring specifically to the UK, defence barristers get all sorts of stuff, but you as a defence barrister here only know the case on the day of the trial. And you are defending somebody fighting for their lives, really. Uh, how, how do you uh, reconcile this? And why is the law developed this way? Uh, 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 is anybody not actually concerned that <laughs> miscarriages of justice could happen as a result of criminal procedure and criminal law is, being, is practiced as it is now today in Malaysia? Well, I think uh, initially, before 51A, we didn't have access to anything except the charge sheet. You go to court, you get the charge sheet. And once in a while, you have a, a DPP who is what you call understanding. He says, okay, look, here are some photographs as well, right? But <laughs> it doesn't really help you, you know. Uh, you still have nothing. So now we have 51A. And 51A basically means documents that the prosecution are going to rely on in proving their case have to be handed over to you. Uh, we also have now, it's quite common for us to have witness statements handed to uh, what you call the defense uh, at least two weeks before the trial. So we actually do get something before the trial. We have time to prepare. So it's not as bad as it used to be. But of course, how much, how much can you do with that limited documentation that you have? Now, you know, if you look at the cases in the past, if you have witnesses who give witness statements to the police during the course of investigation. So when somebody is arrested, when, so, when a police report is lodged, investigation papers are open, the IP, and IO is assigned to that file. Then what happens is the IO will call in witnesses and take statements from those witnesses. Those are statements that are recorded under Section 112 of the Criminal Procedure Code. Now, the question is whether or not you can also get access to those statements, because technically you would want to say that, look, if that is what the witness statement is, then it should be given to us. Uh, in Malaysia, there, there is a case that was decided far back, I think uh, in the 80s, it's the case of Husdi. Now, in Husdi, uh, <clears throat> there's a High Court decision, and the judge there, federal judge sitting, uh, but as a High Court judge, now he ruled that the statements made by the police sorry, statements made by witnesses to the police are privileged. And, this, and by that reason, of course, uh, those, those statements are not supposed to be given to counsel or to the accused, to the defense. <clears throat> Later on, uh, it was shown that that particular case was not, not well, I won't say wrongly, but I don't think it was correct or properly decided because in Husdi, what happened was a reference was made to police reports in defamation cases in India. And of course, we know that in police, police reports are privileged because that is actually a provision, for example, in our Defamation Act, there is actually, there's actually provision that says it's privileged. So it doesn't apply to criminal trials. So what happened was there was actually a challenge brought. I think you remember that the case in which Kim Jong Nam, I think the... The, the, the brother. Yeah, the city, the city Aisha. Uh, and the Court of Appeal to a different position in City Aisha now. City Aisha, that's right. So in City Aisha, the Court of Appeal changed the position a bit and said that, look, yes, an application can be made. And of course, if uh, it is shown that those statements are relevant, then it can be provided to uh, the defense. So it's a, it's a huge move away from Husdi. Subsequently, of course, you have another decision in the federal court, uh, Dr. Sri Najib's case, which says that, no, uh, you cannot actually have access to those documents. But that in that case, the facts are slightly different because I think counsel in that case applied for the whole file. So of course, they said no. So yes, it's, it's a question of us still trying to grapple with the problem that we have. I think uh, the law will develop. I'm quite sure. In fact, in Lim Guan Eng's case, currently being tried uh, in the Sessions Court. And I asked for that case to be transferred to the High Court. One of the reasons in that case was because we wanted uh, this particular point to be dealt with by the Federal Court later. So I think uh, it's a matter of time. These cases will go to the Federal Court. It's unfortunate that uh, Siti Aisha's case uh, did not actually, wasn't actually resolved in the Federal Court because I think at that point in time, there were some developments and uh, the case didn't proceed. Uh, so we still have to develop it. But it, it comes back to what you said earlier, Razdan. I think we need to find uh, a balance. You know, there must be access given to the defense of, of documents that, the, and of course, uh, even exhibits the, that the, the prosecution will rely on. And this is more so because the accused is under remand. So when the accused is under remand, the I.O., the law assumes that the I.O. will investigate uh, for both sides. Uh, that means the, the investigations have to be fair to the accused as well. 
So how does the uh, accused do anything if he's under remand, particularly in the most serious cases? In the less uh, the cases on which they are bail, uh, they are on bail. We have to grapple with the fact that most prosecution witnesses are prosecution witnesses, and therefore we can't uh, we we can't approach them because they are already prosecution witnesses. So on the one hand, you can't approach witnesses because they are your witnesses, but you don't want to give us uh, documents that you have, and we have to go to court and hope for the best. And when something comes our way in a trial, we have to deal with it. So it's it's a bit difficult, but. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, as time goes on, we will develop it a bit more and uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, change things a bit more. A peculiarly Malaysian dilemma. Um, Precisely my point. I always find it more is amazing that there's, there's much greater transparency in the civil matter than the criminal matter. You no, know, but let me, you know, let me just let me just remind you that there's another uh, 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 situation that you got to look at. You know, if you are charged for a case under the <coughs> the uh, what do you call the anti uh, the uh, MACC Act, you have to deal with Section 62 of that Act. Now, you know what Section 62 says? Section 62 says that a person charged for an offence under that Act has to put in a statement of defence. You have to put in a statement of defence before the case in which you have to set out how it is you take issue with the case for the prosecution and you have to give grounds and reasons for you taking that position. So, which means that all you have is the charge sheet. Then you get some documents under 51. The prosecution has the whole file. But before the court has even made a decision as to whether there is a case for you to answer, you are already supposed to put in your defense. Gobin, we're now going to come to what we call the quick fire round, which is a sort of yes, no, very rapid answers. So let me first start with what do you prefer, trials or appeals? Appeals. Why? Because it's focused. It's focused on the records yeah, and the points of law involved. Okay, what do you enjoy more, Parliament or courts? Court. Three, what do you enjoy more, most in practice, the interpersonal skills or the intellectual exercise? I think it's a combination of both. Uh, okay, who is the opponent that you respected the most? Ah, this is a question which I think uh, it is difficult to answer. There's so many, you know. To be fair, there are many out there who've been very professional and, and I have equal respect for, for very many of them. Uh, and I, I don't think I want to start uh, identifying them uh, by in, in name now, you know. Yeah. That's fair enough. Um, and similarly, I think uh, uh, the next question as well, you may you may take the same approach. The judge who challenged you the most. <laughs> uh, I don't think I want to name him. He's still on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the lawyer you learned from the most. Of course, that's Mr. Kapal. Yeah, uh, I thought so. That's right. Okay. Is there a case that you would like to go back and re-argue? Yes, that is the case of Lim Guan Eng, where we mounted a constitutional challenge against Section 62 of the MACC Act. We failed in the High Court Penang, we succeeded in the Court of Appeal, and subsequently it went to the Federal Court. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, with respect, I think it was, uh, there was a lot more that, that needed to be said and argued in that, but of course, Unfortunately, uh, it, it was dismissed quite quickly when we were in court that day. And I think uh, I, I really want to go back and argue that. I think the Court of Appeal got it right. As I said to you just now, right, you can't have Section 62, which demands an accused person to put in a statement of defense, even before the court has made a finding that there's a prima facie case against him. What defense are you talking about if there's no case to begin with? Yeah. Okay. How do you handle losing a case? We move on to the next one. Okay. One piece of advice to a new advocate. My advice to a new advocate would be this, the architect of the failure or success of your client's case is none other than you. So remember that you are actually in battle representing your client. You got to do what's best for him. So you got to take charge and make sure that you put your best foot forward. Okay, good one. Now. I mean, you're a member of parliament, you're a busy, uh, you're a busy uh, uh, practitioner, and I mean, you are, you've been a cabinet minister. Tell us about a day in the life of Gobind Singh today. Today would be a day, of course, without me being a minister and all that. Uh, all right. It's bas it basically starts in the office in the morning. Uh, so I'm here at about 8, 9 o'clock. I'm in court. Uh, nowadays, very commonly, uh, Zoom. 
So, uh, uh, you know, you sit from your office and you argue, uh, be it an appeal, an application in the office itself uh, over the um, over Zoom. Uh, sometimes you have to go to court. There's still physical hearings that go on. Then, of course, you don't just have one hearing a day uh, in the morning. So it is quite common that we have three or four different cases that we got to uh, attend to uh, in the morning. But then subsequently, if parliament is in session, then I have to also go to parliament. Uh, it depends on whether or not I have a question. There's question hour in the morning. If I have a question, then of course I have to manage my time. I have to get to parliament for the question. If there's no question, then I have to try to get parliament call after question hour because that's the time uh, when you can raise concerns using the standing orders and what have you not. Uh, then of course the afternoon will be either carrying on with the trial or debates in parliament, which I enjoy a lot. Uh, so I think earlier when I said uh, that I like court proceedings uh, on appeals, that's because it's very focused, the intellectual side of it. But parliament, one of the most exciting things is actually to get involved in the debate you know, you're able to argue something that invites uh, a discussion among uh, the MPs. That, that's something that, that, that I really enjoy doing uh, in Parliament. And of course, uh, the sessions that deal with uh, the, client, uh, the, the problems in your constituencies as well. So what would happen is uh, you come back from Parliament, come back to the office, see clients. But nowadays, again, a lot of it's on Zoom. So sometimes I do it while I'm in the car on the way back. But sometimes you do have clients who come to your office, so you've got to come back and see them. Uh, once the clients are finished about six or seven o'clock, then you've got to start preparing for the next day. So if the parliamentary debates go on, you've got to prepare uh, that, have a look at that, see what needs to be done, speak to those people who can help you and give you a bit more pointers to what you need to do. If you've got an appeal, then you've got to basically go home, have that quick shower, you know, uh, have your meal, come back to the office, sit down, uh, work on it until about eight or nine o'clock and then go back. And you and I know, you know, uh, lawyers, if we have an appeal going on the next day, right, you sleep with it, you know, the whole night you're thinking about it. Uh, you would have argued your whole case again and again and again before you go to in the morning, you know. So you don't really get much sleep. So next day, you get back to the office, you know, a strong coffee helps and then you get on with it again. And, and that's the reason why, as I said earlier, uh, that rapid answer, what do you do when you lose a case, right? I say in our line, right, there's so much going on. When you lose a case, you don't lose hope. You just say, get into the next file, we'll deal with this, get the appeal in, look at it and try and do your best. Uh, to, 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 to fix it uh, uh, later on. Well, that's, that sounds like an exhausting day. Gobin Singh Dio, thank you very much for being with us on Advocates, the podcast. That was a wonderful interview. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Advocates, the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed the program. Please follow us on all our social media channels. Leave a review or share this episode. And don't forget to tag us. We'd love to hear, your, to hear from you. Thanks. Listen to the voices of the advocate.